Navigating Beyond the Fear, Episode 71. Are you ready to make your law firm a profit generating machine that will free up your time and skyrocket your impact? With more than two decades of business growth experience and having proven that you can be successful while prioritizing your family and your impact, introducing the Profit with Law podcast. I am your host, the creator of the firm differentiator 10x effect, Moshe Amsel. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Profit with Law. I am your host, Moshe Amsel, and is only appropriate as the world is reeling from the effects of COVID-19, otherwise known as coronavirus, that I uh, spend this episode uh, talking about how this affects your law firm and what you can do about it. Now, I know that there's a lot of uh, influencers, a lot of people out there all sharing wonderful messages, and you're probably tired of hearing about it. Uh, you probably have been inundated with a ton of emails, notifications, things like that. Now, uh, I want to just invite you to join me for this episode because I may offer a perspective that you haven't th- seen. I may offer something that you haven't heard. And therefore, you might glean something from it that will help you in this process, in this crisis, as you uh, try to navigate and figure out where everything fits for you um, here. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to talk about fear. I want to talk about how the nation is gripped by fear. And it's, it's all consuming. It, when you allow fear to take over, it controls your thoughts, it controls your emotions, and it, it paralyzes you and makes you unable to move forward. So the first thing that, before you even get into technicalities of what you should or shouldn't do and how you can survive through all of this, uh, before we even talk about that, we need to talk about the elephant in the room, which is the fear that is around us and uh, the eeriness of the world around us because people are doing social distancing, people are staying home, and the the shelves in the stores are empty. Uh, there's all these things that we're seeing that just fuel it, that just feed feed that fear. And you have to not ignore it, because it's important, the, the fear is there for a reason, right? So we're, we're meant to um, have a survival instinct that kicks in, and that's what fear is. Fear um, creates that adrenaline. It creates a survival mechanism, the survival mode for us. So it's important that you recognize the fear and that you figure out what is the right thing for you to do as a person and as a, if you're a family, as a family? Uh, for example, uh, we chose here in, in our family to fully embrace social distancing. We made sure that we had the supplies that we needed and we moved in, closed the doors. And uh, not that we're not leaving the house. We, we'll get in the car and drive around to put my daughter to sleep or, you know, just to get out. But we're literally not going anywhere. We're not interacting with any people. Therefore, we know that we are safe. We know that the the biggest fear out there is the fear of safety. We know that we're safe. Now, that might not be possible for you or it might not be desirable for you. And therefore, you might want to take some risks, personal risks of interacting with other people. And that's okay. Like, you just need to be okay with it and not let the fear still be there. In other words, it needs to be something that you're so comfortable with that you're not afraid of it. And if you are, then maybe you're making the wrong decision for yourself because you're going to be walking around in that fear. Now, so there's one fear, which is the fear of our health. And the next fear is the fear of our well being. How are we going to pay the bills? How are we going to survive? survive this if uh, our income is affected, 
the the economy is collapsing around us. I mean, we see the stock market. We see all these people who are staying home and not going to work. We know that there's got to be a chain of events, um, a domino effect that's happening, even if we don't feel it yet, that's going to be devastating to some, if not all of us, in the way that the economy carries on. And for that, I want to offer this perspective. First of all, it's only money. Money comes, money goes. And if you've been around the block long enough, if you're young, then this will be a harder thing to understand. But if you've been ar around the block long enough, then you know that you've already had peaks and valleys in your income. You've already had peaks and valleys in when you had you were flush with cash and when you were really tight with cash. Um, you might not you might not have experienced a point where you couldn't pay your bills or where you couldn't pay your credit card statements, where you couldn't pay your mortgage. But the reality is is that not paying those things is a far cry from being out on the street and homeless. So if you already have the food that you need in your house and you already have the shelter over your head, then you're you're set for right now. And everything else you can overcome. You can make more money when the economy kicks back in and you can get back on your feet. So to be afraid of that and to allow it to completely derail you from being able to survive and not not only survive but enjoy the moment. It pains me to see the posts on Facebook and the, the conversations that are going on in the groups and in the, in the blogosphere and the, you know, on, on Instagram and LinkedIn, where parents are talking about how awful it's going to be to be locked up with their kids for so many hours on end. And the reality is, is that We've gotten so used to our society and the way that we live and our way of life that we've, at least some of us, have forgotten that we're parents and that we actually love these children and we would love to spend more time with them. So now that we're being forced into spending more time than we wanted to, it's a bad thing. And it's and people are talking about you know how they're going to need wine to get through the day, uh, you know. This is, this is not the way to look at it. It's not the way to deal with it. Embrace the fact that, wow, I'm going to be around my kids. I have the opportunity to, number one, spend some really good high quality time with them. And number two, be an example to them that even in crisis, even when we're stuck at home, even when all this is happening around us, I still have to work. I still have to... Uh, be there for something that I be that I believe in, that I work for, that you know to to honor my integrity and serve my clients. It's an opportunity for you to be an example to your children of what it looks like to be a well-rounded individual. So I offer these to you because I want you to before we even talk about the rest of this episode, I want you to step away from the fear. And I want you to start to look at this situation as an opportunity. There are opportunities around us to take advantage of, even while the world as we know it is collapsing in, there's opportunities that we can take. And they may not be the opportunities that we're looking for. I'm, they may not be the opportunity to grow your law firm. Now, maybe there is. Maybe you're a, a bankruptcy attorney and a, a terrible economy is really good business for you. Um, but ultimately, that's not going to happen today. That Those bankruptcies will be coming. That wave will be coming at the end of this. Okay, um, So you can prepare for that. But what are you going to do today? What is the opportunity today? Is the opportunity today to spend that quality time with your family? Is the opportunity today to uh, spend time formalizing and creating and getting in the habit of a marketing plan that you never had the time to do? Is the opportunity today to implement some pieces of technology that you desperately need in your firm, but you haven't had a chance to do because you're always so busy? Look for the opportunities around you in this situation and embrace the chance you're being given. 
the chance of that you're being given the the gift of time and the gift of space to be able to just be and just be tranquil and just enjoy the moment if you've never taken time and meditated before and now you have this time on your hands and your home and you're not rushing out the door to get the kids to where they need to be and to get to the office maybe take 15 minutes and do a meditation every morning maybe spend some time exercising the thing you've wanted to do for so long but just haven't got to now i know the gyms are closed but put on some shoes put on a jacket and walk outside go for a walk enjoy nature just be present in the moment and don't worry so much about what's going to be because the reality is is that being in fear worrying all of those things they don't solve the problem they only stop you from solving the problem so now that i've got that off my chest let's go into some of the logistics so you're you now you've got this law firm and you're at a crossroads and there's actually multiple crossroads that you're at the first one is do i keep my office open or do i close my office now assuming that you have a physical office if you're working out of the home already if you're already running a virtual practice then this is not a question you need to ask right Um, but can you close your office physically or do you need to physically keep it open okay so if you cannot close your office and you need to keep it open then let's just talk about some things that you might want to do in this process so if you're keeping your office open presumably it's because you are meeting with clients you're or you're meeting with parties whoever they are Um, so what you might want to do is you might want to institute a protocol in your office that's very clearly articulated when somebody walks in so nobody gets offended and nobody gets nervous when they see it so for example if you want to wear a face mask and gloves the entire time that you're talking to somebody then you should have a sign explaining that this is all precautionary and they shouldn't walk in thinking, oh my goodness, you have the virus, okay? Now, you should limit distance from people. You should eliminate handshaking. There should be no handshaking. Even the elbow bumping that was uh, something that was cute on TV um, is actually really bad because they're telling people to cough into their the inside of their elbow, and then you're going and you're bumping elbows on the outside, uh, which is a, a sure way to potentially pass the germs along. So I would limit touching altogether, and I would actually, following, following the CDC guidelines, stay at least six feet away from the other person. So even though you're meeting them in person, you want to keep that six foot distance because that's how far the the virus can travel uh, when they're talking and saliva is coming out of their mouth and there's and you know you don't see it but they're spitting that saliva and it's going distances now the virus is actually pretty dense and heavy so it lands fairly quickly which is why they say six feet uh, really um, sputum can travel even further than that um, so you want to limit distance you want to make no handshaking you want to keep that six foot or more distance. Uh, if you're signing papers, you want to keep, use separate pens. Okay, have disposable pens. Don't even bother cleaning them. Throw it out after somebody else uses it. Now you could be offering the other person gloves. So if somebody comes into the office, you offer them a glove, gloves and a mask, and you're wearing gloves and a mask. Uh, then you can you don't have to worry about that. Uh, simply cleaning the pen surfaces and cleaning the surfaces of the desk is probably sufficient, but disposable pens are fairly inexpensive. You can, you can simply use them and toss them if, if you so choose. Definitely keep disinfectant wipes nearby. So after the meeting, you can thoroughly wipe down all the surfaces uh, that were anywhere near where you and your guest were sitting. And, uh, and again, uh, you, you, you can consider wearing a mask and gloves. You can also consider offering them to your client or your guest in your office. Uh, and, and most importantly, I think, is communication. Make sure that this policy is clear. Make sure that your employees are following it. If you have personnel in the office, uh, if, you know, 
you cannot be too cautious with this. And if you're if you need to keep your office open, give everybody the protection that they need to be able to feel safe and secure. Even though it feels weird initially, they'll get used to it, and um, and they'll be able to to function fully and also be able to come back again day after day and not uh, end up getting sick and um, and contaminating other people and, and spreading this thing further. So that's if you cannot close your office, you have to keep it open. Now, what if you could close your office? You don't need to keep it open. You're not going to be seeing clients. You could work from home. Well, if that's the case, then the question is, can you operate remotely? Are you set up to operate remotely. Now, for many, this has never been something that was a priority. They never got themselves set up. And for others, this is something that is business as usual. They do it all the time. So let's just go through a checklist of things that you probably need, or if you haven't thought about it, want to get and learn how to use so that you can operate remotely. Uh, the first piece of business is a computer. So if your computer in the office is a desktop, it's it's less realistic to take that home with you. Although if it's a permanent move uh, for a few for four weeks, then you probably can do that. Um, but if you have a laptop, have access to a laptop, that's going to be far easier. Especially when you set up at home. Uh, I can tell you from my own. Uh, personal experience, I work from home. I have uh, an entire floor in my house as the office, uh, but I still like to, once in a while, take the laptop up to the couch in my living room and put my feet up and work from there. Uh, sometimes I like to work from the back deck. Sometimes I like to work from the kitchen. Maybe when I go up for lunch, I don't want to run back down to my desk. I want to change the scenery. So I like having the ability to move my computer with me where I'm going. Uh, so a laptop is really cool and nifty for that. Um, the second thing is a phone. Now, obviously, everybody's got a phone. You have a cell phone. But you probably don't want to give your cell phone number out to your clients. So you want to make sure that you have the ability to mask the phone number or use the phone number from your office if that's possible, uh, but at least uh, not to have your cell phone number being the one that you're using to, to go out. So um, there's all kinds of options when it comes to phones. Uh, everything from uh, having a Google Voice number that you're using to uh, make and receive the phone calls to a voice over IP system that your office is on. If you already have that, it's simply a matter of plugging in another extension or using their software version of their phone. Or maybe they even have an app for your cell phone. And uh, then there's also uh, the ability to, uh, one of the things we're going to talk about is video conferencing. So the video conferencing applications often have a phone feature in there as well, which you can harness. It's basically another voice over IP option. Then one last option for phone service is a virtual reception, virtual answering service, smith.ai. Smith.ai is... Uh, somebody who has sponsored our law firm growth summit in the past and um, uh, that we definitely, uh, Maddie Martin is a, a friend of the show, a friend of mine, and uh, we definitely would recommend that you check them out uh, where you can have your, your phone number forwarded to them and then they can take the initial call and then they can get a hold of you. Uh, if you know if it's uh, deemed necessary, and this way there is that intermediary. It also gives you that professional front, that professional look. So if you don't have your staff coming in, you don't have the ability for your receptionist to answer the phone and then transfer it to you. Now you have that ability with uh, this answering service, and um, they're very reasonable, uh, and and it's worthwhile checking out. From the laptop and the phone, the next question is, do you have the software that you need? Uh, now, if you're a, a firm that still runs on paper, then we have other conversations we need to have, but this is going to be very challenging for you. Uh, hopefully, you're already using some sort of practice management uh, suite uh, or practice management software like Clio and 
you're, that's already in the cloud, right? So now there are some practice management applications that are server-based, and if you have your own IT infrastructure, you have your own server in-house, this could be complicated, and you want to definitely engage your IT provider to set up the ability for you to VPN through a, a virtual private network, connect into your office, and access your, your software that way, whether it's using a... Uh, a thin client like a remote desktop connection or accessing the database directly over the virtual private network. Uh, if I am talking mumbo jumbo to you, that's fine. If that, you know, if, if that's the case, you probably do have an IT provider. Just get your IT provider involved in helping get you set up properly from your home to be able to access that software. Now, you may want to consider other applications that maybe you're not using yet, So, but some things you are, right? So document storage, document management, I'm sure that you're using that already. The question is, is it set up for you to be able to access it from home? Uh, similar to your practice management software, if it's being hosted in the office on a network-attached storage device or on a server, then you're going to need access to that to be able to access your files. I use Google G Suite and the G Suite at the higher level, which is $10 a month per user, gives unlimited storage for the entire company. So uh, essentially, uh, we can store as much as we want uh, and, and not run out of space. Uh, that's a great option. Uh, of course, they compete with Microsoft, uh, who has Office 365 and their platform, which includes uh, Microsoft OneDrive, which is the, the same thing, uh, competes with the Google product. And there are other, definitely other applications out there that do the same thing, but you definitely want to have a place to store documents, to retrieve documents share documents securely with clients, have clients be able to upload documents, and so on. Uh, in addition to that, uh, maybe you have CRM software, maybe you have calendaring software, uh, maybe you have software to uh, write or compose draft documents, uh, maybe you have software specific to the work that you do. So I know that bankruptcy attorneys, for example, use proprietary software to prepare their bankruptcy. You know, that software application, you want to make sure that you have access to from the home. And if these are things that you don't have in place yet, then maybe now is a good opportunity to start implementing some of that and putting it into place and creating it. Uh, then in addition to that, there's video conferencing. Now, I live by video conferencing. So I run a completely virtual uh, business and I use an application called Zoom. I'm sure that you've heard of it. I'm sure that you've experienced it at some point. But if you haven't, it's spelled Z-O-O-M. And uh, Zoom video conferencing is the gold standard today when it comes to video conferencing. It's very easy to use. Uh, any practically any platform that somebody has, they can get on it. And even if they can't, there's always a dial-in number where they can connect by audio only. But I love video conferencing because it's as close to a face-to-face -face meeting as you can get. And when I serve people throughout the world, it's, it's impossible that I'm going to meet them all face-to-face. -face. And this allows me to do it um, and create that relationship, read body language, uh, be able to, to really focus on the other individual um, and be involved in the conversation. So video conferencing is a must. And now Zoom has a free option. So you definitely can get started with it with, for free. I'm on uh, quite the premium platform. I use all kinds of features in there. So I pay a significant amount of money every month to them. Uh, but for you, you could probably get away with the free version to start and then see where you want to take it from there. I have uh, I used a cloud recording feature and I record all my calls. Now I know that my target market here is listening to this podcast are attorneys, and some of you are going to be um, up in arms with me even with sharing that, um, saying that you can't do that. You look, you guys can do whatever you're comfortable with, whatever works for you. Uh, for me. It's got the recording icon on the screen, so the other party knows it's being recorded. It's not like um, I'm tricking anybody, and the recording is very helpful to the people that I am having conversations with. Um, I generally am not using it to go back and say, look, 
you agreed to this and now you're arguing that to something else. It's usually I am doing a coaching session or I am helping somebody with something and I, ultimately I provide the recording to them so they can go back and listen to it again. Um, but you can definitely see how having these conversations recorded would definitely be helpful to you um, for many different reasons when you're working from home. Now, finally, you need to have a way to collect money. So you want to make sure you have a payment processing system in place. The gold standard for law firms is a company called LawPay, where they will act as the intermediary and uh, allow somebody to enter a credit card in, and ultimately you get the money deposited into your bank account. Um, they are quite flexible. They're also... Um, not the cheapest payment processor on the block, uh, but definitely they get the job done securely and efficiently. And uh, you definitely want to have a way to collect money. Uh, one of the big challenges of closing a physical office and working from home is receiving your mail, uh, which might include getting checks that you need to desperately deposit into the bank. So uh, one of the things for mail is you might want to simply do mail forwarding. So you can go to the post office or you can even go online and do it online so you don't have to expose yourself in the post office. And you can go online and just turn on mail forwarding from your business address to your home address. Now, probably will take uh, a couple of days to kick in. But once it does, all that mail will be forwarded to, to you. And uh, then you can turn it off when things return back to normal. So that was a very long uh, winded explanation of what you can do if you can operate remotely and you're able to close your office, you can operate remotely. Now, the next question that you need to ask yourself is, will you have clients? Will your business be affected? And this is, this is a tough one because I can think of m most practice areas that you would be affected by a decrease in clients, maybe a decrease in new clients coming in, you continue to serve your existing clients, uh, or what if you do something that requires the court? What if you're in litigation? What if you're in bankruptcy? What if you're, what if you're doing uh, contested divorces uh, and, and custody issues? Well, if you're, or what if you're a cr in, in a criminal court, right? If the court is closed, then you can't do any work. So, or or you could do only minimal work. So this is something that we need to think about. Well, is my source of revenue going to dry up because of the current situation? Are my typical clients such that are they're susceptible to the economic environment that even if the court is open, even if the court, I'm not affected by the courts, but I'm not going to get the business because people are worried about whether they're going to lose their jobs. So if you expect a decrease in business, a decrease in revenue, a decrease in client flow, then you need to immediately start to take a financial analysis of your situation because this is a problem that can very, very quickly spiral out of control. And it could be the difference between you surviving this and your law firm not surviving and you going out of business because you ran out of cash or because you accrued so much debt you just couldn't get out of the hole. So let's talk about this for a moment. This is the elephant in the room that maybe a lot of people are avoiding and a lot of people are not talking about. This is where you have to take stock of your expenses and you need to start categorizing your expenses into now, there's a few different categories. So there are things that you're contractually obligated to pay, uh, like your rent. You probably have a lease signed uh, for your rent, so you probably can't just turn your rent off. Then there's employment contracts. If you're, if you're contracted with your employees, you may not be able to just easily lay them off, uh, or you may not want to, even if there's no contract in place. Uh, you may have good staff that you want to keep, but... If you keep employing them and there's no work, then you have to keep paying payroll even though there isn't any work. Uh, so what I would do is I would start with identifying 
And I, I would basically take look at the last three months bank statements, credit card statements, or I'll just look in your QuickBooks if your books are up to date and start to look at the transactions and identify the transactions into, I have to keep this no matter what. This is something I can consider cutting or this is a definite, I can get rid of this today. Those are the three ca categories. Go through and categorize all of them. The first thing is cut all the ones in category number three, all the ones that you know, hey, I could just cut this today. I signed up for this application, never used it. I signed up for the subscription and it, you know, it's a magazine that I never get time to read. Whatever the case may be, cut it. Okay, even if the renewal is not for another three months, what's going to happen is, is you do this exercise now and then three months from now, you're going to forget that you did it. So if you leave it open three months from now, it's going to hit that that charge is going to hit and it might be the least opportune time ever because you'll be at the tail end of this cash crunch and you're really going to be sorry that you didn't do it now. So just go in and do those cancellations now. So that's the first level ax those expenses. The next level are the ones that you really want to keep, but you can cut them if you have to. Now, most likely many of your employees are going to fall into that camp. Now, if you have an employee that's such a star that, and you know how hard it is to find good people, they could end up in category number one, where the only way you're letting them go is if the firm is closing. And otherwise, you're going to find, by hook or by crook, you're going to find a way to keep them. So when it comes to employees, and the reason I'm going to focus for employees for, on employees for a moment is because unless you're a solo, um, any law firm that has multiple people working there, payroll is your biggest expense. It's your biggest overhead. It's the biggest thing that's pulling cash out every, if, every week, every two weeks, once a month, whatever your payroll cycle is, you got to come up with that money. And you got to pay that employee and that employee needs to be paid on time. It's not like a vendor where you might be able to renegotiate terms. You may be able to, to push the ball down, down the road and say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to pay you. We'll take care of it in two weeks. You can't do that with an employee. You got to pay them on time. So you have some options when it comes to employees. The first thing that I would do is I would analyze, is this somebody that is really worth keeping? Is there somebody that I am really happy with? Is it somebody that I'm, I was on the fence to begin with, and now I have a reason to just say, let, let me cut and run. So you have to do that analysis first. So the first analysis is, is this somebody worth keeping or do I just cut and, and, you know, let them go and just move on. And I'll, and when I'm ready to rehire, I'll do a better job and hire a better person the next time. So that's step number one. Now, if you get past that step, now you've got the employee uh, where you want to keep them if you could. So now you got to look at some options. Okay. Uh, one option that we're going to talk about is alternate sources for cash, where maybe you can come up with money to float them for a little while. But if you play that game, then what I need you to do is I need you to set a time frame. Whatever that time frame is, you have to determine. I'm going to keep them for three months. I'm going to float them for three months. If in three months things haven't turned around, I'm going to have no choice but to let them go. What I just chose three months. It doesn't matter what that time frame is, but you have to predetermine what the time frame is because this could end up being a case where you're just paying and paying and paying and there's no end in sight and you end up going deeply into debt to keep this person where ultimately you never you never turn things around to be able to use that person. So we don't want to we don't want to go into deeply into debt to con to continue a bad problem. We only want to do that if it's going to be a positive investment for the future. So and this is one of those gray areas. This is one of those things where you don't know, which is why I think that you need to predetermine a period of time to decide you know, if it if if it works by this date, great. And if it doesn't, then that's going to be, you know, that's when I say, sorry, this is not working. We got to let you go. 
Another option that you have is just to have a heart to heart with your employee. So this depends on your relationship with the employee. It depends on your size of your firm, but a really small firm with a worker who's been there for a long time, you could definitely go and have this conversation where you can say, look, I, I can't afford to keep paying you. I really want to keep you here because I think this is going to turn around and I would love to have you stay on as an employee of the firm, but there's no way I can carry you until that happens. And I completely understand if an opportunity arises for you, you got to earn a living and you get another job. I get it. And, and you're free to go if that happens. What I would like to do is I would like to just furlough you and hold your position for you. So that if you're still available, when I can turn things around and have you resume, that you can resume with me. And that is the most upstanding way keeping somebody without needing to pay them while you're keeping them and without there being hard feelings because they know that they're desired. They know that you want them. They know that they're valued, but they also know that you just simply can't pay them. And, and because you can't afford it, they're, you know, they're basically unemployed. Now, you don't want to keep them from getting unemployment. So I would definitely, um, you know, if they have access to unemployment, I would definitely officially fire them, you know, or, or let them go um, so that they can be free to do that. Uh, but you can definitely have this conversation where you would bring them back on in a heartbeat if things turn around. And you can even continue to communicate with them in this process to let them know what the status is, let them know what's going on if they if they are interested. So you can ask them, do you want me to keep you updated on what's happening with the firm? Do you want me to let you know what, you know, what the what the what the measurement I'm using and when I'll know it's time, it, you know, that you can come back? So that's up to you how exactly you handle that, but that's one thing that you can do. Another thing is if you're you don't need an office anymore, you're ready to go virtual, maybe you break your lease. Uh, it might cost you a couple of months to get out of it. If you have to pay the whole lease, and that's a different story, it might not be worth it. But if you can get out of the lease by just paying for a month or two and, and, and getting out of it, and it's time anyway, it's something you've been thinking about doing, you know, that's another thing where you can just get rid of that, you know, that ongoing cost. We don't know how long this thing's going to last. We don't know what the economic effect is going to be. You may be um, well ahead of the game. Uh, by doing that. And then the the last thing that I can g offer for your financial situation is to look for alternate sources for cash. Now, um, all of these sources are going to basically be borrowing money. So before we before I offer you some options for borrowing money, I just want to make this disclaimer. First of all, there are some people who don't take on debt at all. You know, the, from the Dave Ramsey camp, which um, which is fine. I, I don't have an opinion, a negative opinion about that. Uh, I think it's it's noble and admirable. And there people who are not willing to take on any debt are going to make better business decisions than people who are because they're not going to borrow uh, to keep a bad problem around. Now. That doesn't mean that everybody who borrows is making poor decisions. So I I believe that there is a there is you can borrow for two purposes. One purpose is to uh, to continue a bad a, a bad habit, and the other is to actually make a very well thought out logical investment in your business that's going to that's almost guaranteed to pay returns. Now in good times. That might look like I have proven that my marketing strategy works and now I want to increase the fuel behind. I want to increase the spend of that strategy and I need it, it takes from when I increase the spend in advertising, it takes six months till I see the client increase. Now I need six months worth of those marketing dollars in order to make this next leap in my growth. That is a very good use of borrowed money because the exponential growth you're going to see from that is going to be far more than the cost of borrowing that money. Whereas borrowing money to try 15 different marketing strategies may not be a good use of, of borrowed money when it comes to growing your business. So you need to first, before you look at options for borrowing money, you need to first make sure that you're not 
putting a Band-Aid on a bigger problem that once you blow through the money you've borrowed, you're going to be back to where you started and nothing will have been resolved and you're just going to have this mountain of debt. That's the first thing that you need to do and you need to get really, really clear on that. Once you're clear that this is the right step, you have some options. Now, first of all, in the show notes, I'm going to leave the link for this. I'm not even going to share it here because it's too hard to say. Actually, I'm going to pull it up while I'm doing this because maybe it's not too difficult um, and I could easily share it. So, But the SBA has, you have access to disaster loans from the SBA. And um, actually, it's not a difficult link. So it's disasterloan.sba.gov forward slash ELA. Uh, we'll link that up in the show notes. So you can just click on it in the, in the uh, browser. And it's going to be profitwithlaw.com forward slash 071 is where the show notes will be, reside on our website. But in, when a, a area is declared a, a disaster area... It allows the SBA to make disaster loans available, which are really good terms. Um, the payback, I believe, is over 30 years, and um, and the interest rate is 3.25%, I believe. So it's really, really good rate, really good terms as far as the payback. So you can get access to money that can keep you afloat, that you can, that you can invest in the business to keep things moving along. And uh, it's based on your level of, of business in, in the past. So they're going to look at your previous tax return. And I'm not sure the exact process. I actually sent an email to one of the people at the SBA office to see if I can get somebody um, on an interview here on the podcast. But um, that being said, the, the disaster loans are only available if it's a disaster area. So if you go to that URL, the first thing is there's three links there. One of the first one is to check whether you're in a disaster area. So they have a, a cute little tool there, and you can click on it. And what's wacky is is that I'm in New York State. New York State has been, you know, the the governor has declared a state of emergency. The county executive where I live has declared a state of emergency. We're in one of the fastest growing and and most prevalent areas for this COVID nineteen, and yet we don't show up on the map as a disaster area and the state of Connecticut does. So uh, I don't really understand how that's controlled or who makes that determination, but you need to first check and see if you're in a disaster area. And if you are, then you can go through the process. Now an SBA loan, even this disaster loan um, is quite cumbersome to apply for. It's a lot of paperwork, but it could be well worth it. I mean, I I don't know what kind of access you'll get, but if you get access to $100,000 or, you know, $150,000, what can that do for you to get you um, through this crisis? So that's uh, the first place that I would look is to see if that's something that is an option for you. The second place I would look is credit, credit cards. Many times a credit card has a low or a 0% interest offer. And if you're not carrying a balance on it, you might be able to extract cash or transfer a balance from that card to pay something else, uh, something else off, something else is coming due. And um, you also could apply for new credit. Now, if your credit is good, you probably will get approved for new credit. So what I would do is, is I would research credit cards that have a 0% intro offer on purchases. And uh, when you do the application, uh, what what I would do is I would apply to at least five or six of them at the same time. Because what happens is that when you're applying for credit at the same time, it doesn't affect your credit score when you shop around. So you can you can request, you know, try to get credit from multiple cards at the same time without it being ne- affecting you negatively. Now, if you're lucky, then you get approved by all of them and you get some access to free money for temporarily. So that might be six months, 12 months, 18 months that you can put purchases on the cards and essentially just move your spending to these new cards with the zero interest offer and, um, and operate that way. So you're just making your minimum payments and you're able to continue. Now, you're obviously not going to be able to pay payroll 
um, on a 0% interest card. Uh, but if you move everything else, then perhaps you have the cash and the means to, to continue paying payroll. Another place that I might look is family. So if you have family that has some money and you can get a, a, a family loan, something temporary to keep you afloat, uh, you can do that. And the last thing is your retirement account. Now, this is would be terrible timing unless in your retirement account you've moved to cash already because the market is down. So if you liquidate some of your holdings or all of your holdings, then you're going to lock in your losses or lock in this, you know, where the market is today, where there's definitely a, an opportunity for price appreciation if you can leave it in there. So that aside, assuming that it's in cash or, or, or it makes sense for you, you can pull money out of a retirement account, a Roth IRA or an IRA, for, for 60 days. And as long as you put it back in within 60 days, it's considered a rollover and it's not considered an early distribution, which would, which would get penalized and taxed. So now this is risky because you have 60 days and then after that, it becomes a very costly move. But if you know that you need something temporary, you just need to free things up, you know, for a brief period of time and 60 days is, is all you need. Uh, this could be a very easy way to access money that you already have um, that can can then be put back. So the, the here, those are some uh, some ideas, some out of the box uh, ways to look at alternate sources for cash to get you through. Now, I'm going to leave you with one more thought, and that is. Um, that if you're going to be less busy now, if new clients are not coming in, rev revenue is drying up, we, you know, we covered all of these challenges, but that means that you have time on your hands. That means that you're not busy with client work all the time. Now, if you have time on your hands, this is a perfect time for you to beef up your marketing, um, you know, start doing some of those things with marketing that you've always wanted to do. You just never had time to do. Start organizing your systems. Uh, figure out what technologies you've been wanting to implement and start implementing them, playing with them, learning how to use them. Use this time to do the things that you've always wanted to do, but just never had the time to do. And with that, I want to introduce something to you and present you with an offer that you'll never be presented with again. Since I put on the Law Firm Growth Summit back in December, I've had people asking me, listen, I'm in the early stages of my law firm. I am, I'm a newer firm. Um, I, I need an inexpensive way to learn how to become a better firm owner, to learn how to grow. And this has been something I've been working on behind the scenes, uh, having conversations with some of the uh, top marketers in the industry, some of the top tech people in the industry, and um, it's actually early in uh, what we were going to do. So we were going to create the Law Firm Growth Incubator. And what it is is a, a monthly membership that gives you access to, the, to these major areas. So practice management, running your firm, the financial side of your firm, that's the expertise I bring to the table, marketing, and, um, and technology are the two outside um, expertise areas that, um, you know, that, I, that I'm bringing in a, another professional into the mix uh, for this. Now, this ultimately, when we had it, have it set up and, and running, it's going to be offered at $147 a month or $149 a month, something like that, $150 a month. And um, we were not quite ready to go to market with it, uh, but with everything that's happening right now, we want to create that area where you can get the education that you need to do these things. If you have time on your hands, we want you to be able to implement that, that new marketing thing. We want you to be able to, to choose that new technology, and we want you to have the support in doing that. We want you to have the guidance in doing that. So this is not built yet. It's brand new. And what I'm doing is, is I am offering this to you at um, a unique opportunity. And that opportunity is that you get to be a founding member of this incubator. And in doing so, you're going to 
um, get it at a cost that is un unheard of and will never be offered again, I guarantee it. Uh, but you're coming in understanding that right now there's nothing there. But immediately we're going to start hosting live calls for you to join where we're going to start educating you and get and taking you down this road and on this journey as we build the platform out. And what, what's, what we're going to ask from you is that you give us the feedback on what you need and um, what's being helpful, what's not helpful, so we can build this around your needs and make it even better for, for the future people who are coming in. So if you're interested in joining the incubator for $27 a month, $27 a month, you heard that, and that's lifetime, so it'll never go up for you. We're only opening 50 spots at that price. The first 50 people that come in are going to be our crash test dummies, okay? You're, gonna, you're going to uh, come into something that doesn't exist, and we're going to create it together. Um, and it's going to be a great and enjoyable ride. So if you're interested in joining me on that ride, then you want to go to profitwithlaw.com forward slash incubator, profitwithlaw.com forward slash incubator. And, uh, you'll be asked for your personal information. There's no sales page there. There's nothing explaining what it is. I basically just explained it. You know what you're getting. We're not getting right now, but literally within the next couple of weeks, you you will start to be taken on this journey. So it's not like I'm going to spend $27 a month and then three months from now, I'm going to hear from Moshe. And that's not what's going to happen. We, we're we going to start providing value to you immediately. But I can tell you that this is, it's going to immediately jump in price once we get those first 50 spots filled. And you're hearing it, you're hearing it here on the podcast first. So it's my, my podcast listeners are going to be the first ones that have an opportunity to join this. You know it's out there in the marketplace. You know that this is an insane opportunity and offer. And I know that the timing is bad to get you to spend money on something, which is part of why I wanted to rush to bring this to market and create a reason to offer this at this um, crazy low cost. Now, obviously, there's cost involved for us to create this, so I can't offer it for free. I wish that I could, um, but this is this is as 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 good as it's going to get. Uh, so again, if you want support marketing your financials and your structure around your firm, your staffing, technology in the firm, we're going to support you in this in this incubator. Uh, and it's going to it's going to look like each of these areas is going to have an informational call each month, and then there'll be a support mechanism as well. So we're still going to hash that out, and uh, you're certainly welcome to leave if it's not what you thought it was. But I think that we're going to work together to create a beautiful product, and I'm really excited about this, and I'm excited about the opportunity. So again profitwithlaw.com forward slash incubator. And even if uh, this doesn't interest you, I hope that the rest of the episode was helpful and, and is going to help you with uh, moving in a positive direction amidst all of the cloudiness and the fear that's going on around us. Because you know what? You are where your attention is. The results that you get come from where you put your attention and if you put your attention on all this negativity that's what you're going to get in return and i believe that we each have a choice every single day and we can choose to be happy we can choose to be positive we can choose to see the bright side and if we do chances are that we're going to be just fine so with that i'm going to leave you and i will catch you on the next episode take care Thank you for tuning into the Profit With Law podcast. Your feedback is extremely valuable to us as well as helping us reach more people with this valuable content. Please leave us a rating and review in your favorite podcast directory. Join us again next time when we are back with even more strategies to profit with law.